uh, the way the church calendar works, uh, the time between um, Pentecost Sunday and the first Sunday of Advent, the next, you know, that next season, uh, is called ordinary time. And uh, we have been through, uh, today is the 23rd Sunday of ordinary time, uh, so it's been a long haul since something special went on. And uh, the final Sunday before Advent is Christ the King Sunday, which technically on the Christian calendar around the world, that's next Sunday. We, however, are going to observe that today. Uh, and then next week, uh, rather than Christ the King Sunday as our theme, uh, we'll have a Thanksgiving theme. Uh, and so that's why we're kind of observing this a, a week early. Uh, so today we're observing Christ the King Sunday, uh, next Sunday, Thanksgiving Sunday. The next Sunday will, it will be the first Sunday of Advent. Who could believe? Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over the livestock and all the wild creatures and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves over the ground. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, and look at uh, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 22. Verses 15 to 17 to get us started. Matthew 22, verses 15 to 17. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words, him being Jesus. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? <clears throat> so I want to begin by making three observations about that particular passage before we move on in that, in that uh, passage. And the first one is, is that we have an odd partnership. Um, the Pharisees and the Herodians uh, were not normally very friendly with one another. Um, think of like the Democrats and the Republicans multiplied. Uh, you know, it was that kind of a, of a disagreement. They were uh, basically different parties in some ways. Uh, the Pharisees, um, you know, they were just anti-Rome, anti, anti, anti. Uh, and the only reason um, that they kind of lived with it, practically, there's nothing they could do about it. But functionally also, uh, they believed that, that it was God's punishment. And, you know, we have to take God's punishment. You know, we, we, that's not something we can really fight against. Uh, we deserved it. Of course, the Pharisees believed our nation deserves it because of all you sinners in our country. Uh, they didn't think themselves were to blame. They blamed it on everybody else. Um, <clears throat> but uh, the Herodians, on the other hand, uh, called that because they were friends and supporters of Herod, which was like the local king uh, under Caesar, the, the empire uh, emperor. Uh, and so uh, because they supported the, the Romans, they supported Herod and his, his party and everything, uh, they were called Herodians after Herod. Uh, and uh, so those two didn't get along. Uh, the Pharisees and the Herodians were basically enemies. They didn't like each other. They didn't agree with each other. They were constantly fighting and bickering. Uh, but here, they're kind of partnering up. Uh, and we're all familiar with the idea about, you know, a common enemy. Uh, you know, it's, you know you, you're fighting and hate each other. Uh, you know, I've seen it with, like, brother and sister. They, they fight, they don't like each other, they're not getting along. And then some outsider picks on one of them. 
then they suddenly band together to go after the one that picked up, you know. It's, um, and so they, neither of them liked Jesus. They both thought Jesus was a problem. Uh, and so they kind of team up here because they have the common enemy of Jesus, even though they don't get along themselves. And the next thing we see happening in this passage is what I call the big butter up. Uh, they're going to ask Jesus, and before they do, they want to kind of take away his, uh, his caution. They want to take away his weariness. You know, they're going to they're gonna butter him up. So they come talk about how we know that you're impartial and you're so honest and, you know, you're great and all this, you know, and you tell the truth and, you know, all this, uh, so that they can kind of disarm him a little bit and get him uh, not, not really thinking about what's going on. Um, and then, of course, there's the question. They finally get around to the question. The question is, uh, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? And so that's the question. Uh, I want to say a few words about uh, the imperial tax. Uh, the imperial tax uh, was a form of a tribute tax. It wasn't a, a property tax. It wasn't an income tax or a sales tax. Uh, it was simply a tax on non-citizen subjects of the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire conquers your country. Uh, they're, they're running things. They kind of put a government over yours. They brought their army in. They're occupying your land. And they say, for all of you people who are subject to the Roman Empire that aren't Roman citizens, uh, you got to pay. Uh, and so that, that tax was uh, not what they were happy with. And paying it was kind of a, a concrete act of submission to, the Rome, to Rome. Uh, if you actually paid the tax, then you were admitting, I don't have a choice, uh, Rome is my boss, I've got to pay this tax to them. Uh, and they were very uh, unhappy about that. And then there's uh, the coin itself. Uh, which with the tax was usually paid. It happened to be the exact amount. Uh, this is how much they charged. Um, and this is a uh, Roman de denarius from Jesus' era. Um, on the one side of the coin, there is uh, Tiberius, uh, the current Caesar. Uh, I think he was third in line. Uh, and by the way, uh, you don't, we don't have a, a month of Tiber, do we? Uh, his, his two predecessors, uh, Augustus and Julius, we have July and August, thanks to those two Caesars. Um, and then uh, that particular pattern ended. Um, and to give you an idea, by the way, of the nature of how these Caesars operated, uh, Julius Caesar was first, and he got July named after him, and had been named something else prior to that. Uh, and then Augustus became the emperor, and so he renamed the month August. And then he said, it's not fair and fitting that July has more days than August. So they took a day and added it to August, which is why in our calendar, it's like every other month. And then you get to July and August, they're 31 months in a row. Because Augustus uh, was an egotistical man. And he wanted his month to have as many days as his father's month. Uh, and, and so on the coin, one side was inscribed, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. And the other side of the coin was inscribed, high priest. Uh, and, and so that idea of the son of the divine Augustus, uh, that throwing in divinity to the emperor was one of those things that the Roman Empire did. And, uh, and then referring to him as being the high priest, uh, of course, you know, the Jews, they believed that, that God had set aside a tribe and a, a subset of a tribe to be the priests of Israel. And the, and the high priest was the priest who uh, went to the temple and, and worshipped God. And so to refer to uh, this uh, pagan king uh, as, a, as a priest uh, was a no-no. And all of that brings us to Jesus' dilemma with this question. <clears throat> the dilemma was that the Jews, all of the masses of the people, they were against the tax. And they found it insulting, and they found it borderline blasphemous uh, 
putting in the air that, you know, he's the son of the divine Augustus, that's blasphemy. And besides that, they had the Ten Commandments, which was included, uh, no graven images. And uh, there are those today who argue that uh, it was their legalism that got them into trouble here. Uh, that commandment had to do with in worship. You know, no other gods before you, don't make idols, no graven images. And, and that was referring to for the purpose of worshiping. It didn't mean you can't ever have an image of somebody. Uh, just not to worship. Uh, but they didn't see it that way. They were these, the Pharisees were these legalistic, uh, no graven images means no graven images. Uh, and so having this coin with the Caesar's uh, face on it was a no-no. They thought that's breaking the Ten Commandments and we don't like it. Um, and so the Jewish people, if Jesus said, yes, it's right to pay the tax, uh, they were going to be mad at Jesus. And they were going to abandon <laughs> Jesus and turn against him and things just would not go well. So, so yes was a, a bad answer uh, for Jesus to give. And then, of course, the Herodians, supporters of Herod, if Jesus said no, they're immediately running to Herod and his officials, to Herod and his officials, uh, telling them, uh, telling on Jesus to them, uh, for which Jesus would be arrested, and the crime for that was sedition or treason. Uh, that's how important it was. You, know, you, don't, you don't mess with the Roman Empire's taxes. <laughs> Uh, and you know, and you don't mess with their cult emperor worship and all of that. Uh, they had kind of given the Jews uh, some special waivers um, to be able to worship God, but they better keep their mouths shut and do it quietly, and, and they're still going to pay the tax. Kind of a situation going on. And so, no was not a good answer for Jesus to give. Uh, so whether he said yes or whether he said no, uh, Jesus is, is is in trouble. So that's his dilemma. So let's take a look now at what Jesus did in the situation. Uh, we'll go to verses 18 to 22. But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites! Why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius. And he asked them, Whose image is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give it back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, so they left him and went away. So first of all, he knew it was a trick. Uh, he could tell that they weren't really coming to him with this political question. They'd been struggling ethically whether or not they should pay the tax. He knew they came to him, pure and simple, uh, to get him to answer one way or the other so that he would be in trouble. They, they thought they really had, had strung a, a good trap on him. So he begins by kind of uh, humiliating them by asking them to bring him the coin. And of course by, uh, by those accusers bringing him the coin, there was this admission that, you know, we, we talk about it not being a good idea, but we've got the coins. Uh, you know, oh, you know, you, we shouldn't be doing that. Uh, can I have it in here? Well, yeah, I've got one. So, so that's going on. Uh, they actually have one. And then he asked them, you know, whose image and, and whose inscription is it? And then, of course, it's Caesar's. Uh, now, there was a, uh, a saying or a proverb uh, going around at the time, and the Latin translates a couple of different various forms. But the gist of it was this. He is king whose coin is current. So they said, you know, the coinage is a pretty good sign of who's controlling things. Uh, this guy can come in and say that he's the king, and that guy can, but if you look at the coins being passed around, that's how you tell who the king really is at that particular time and place. Uh, so whoever's uh, coin is current is the king. And so having the coin uh, was acknowledgement that Caesar is king. Uh, that was kind of a, a confession that, that you made by just using the coin to some extent, uh, again, in that time and place. So with them admitting that Caesar's king and, and he's got the coins, Jesus said to them, 
give back to Caesar what is Caesar's. But notice he didn't just say give to Caesar. He's not talking about, yeah, he said give back. And so he was talking about kind of an exchange. Um, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's. And I think we need to interpret that uh, not just literally. Uh, Jesus didn't simply mean uh, Caesar owns the coins and you're just borrowing them. You know. uh, but, but, there's, but there's meaning behind that. And basically it comes down to this. Uh, when we think about what, what belongs to Caesar, we first have to look at, at what Caesar provided as the emperor of the Roman Empire. What was he responsible for? Uh, and we get this long list. Uh, Caesar was responsible for providing uh, the Roman army, uh, which of course is not something the Jews were thankful for, uh, but it existed. Um, the police force, firefighters, a highway system, and of course everyone knows about the Roman roads. Uh, they, were, they took great advances forward to civilization because they were road builders. Uh, education, water and sewer systems, we all hear about uh, the Roman aqueducts that they built to provide water and sewer systems. Uh, the monetary system, we're literally talking about the coinage. Um, you know, and I'm thankful, like in America, that we have a, an official currency. Um, you know, that hasn't always been that way. Back in the early days, you know, the revolutionary period, you know, all the states uh, had their own currency and their own coins, and you'd go from state to state and have to do currency exchanges, and, uh, you know, then, of course, the Civil War, uh, the Confederate money, the Union money. Oh, I don't take Confederate money, and I don't take the Union money, and, and all this bigger grant. And, uh, and so having a monetary system did amazing things for any economy, and the Roman Empire provided that. Uh, they, they set up a monetary system. And there are other things that they set up, uh, and it's good. So, so in exchange for that, there is a sense in which uh, Caesar deserves taxes and revenue. Uh, if the government's providing all of those things, they have to be paid for, and so, so we owe taxes and revenues uh, to do that. And then along with that, uh, as the leaders, uh, there is the idea of, of submission and respect and honor. And we see that in America, you know, we think about patriotism. And this has been um, an especially patriotic week, I think, in many ways. Uh, besides being the midterms, uh, an important time in our country, uh, just a couple days ago was uh, Veterans Day. Uh, and so, uh, Veterans Today, just one? Is that right? Two. Two. All right, uh, and so uh, America took time to thank our veterans this week. Uh, we joined them. Thank you, guys. Um, and, uh, and so those two things together uh, really has, uh, you know, our, our country in our minds, uh, our, our patriotism in our minds in a special way, uh, and we think about all of that. But one of the things we need to recognize uh, is that here in America, instead of Caesar, uh, we have a federal republic. You know, if you go to Wikipedia, what kind of government does America have? It's a federal republic. Or another way of looking at it, they will tell you, is that it's a representative democracy. And so it's both of those things. Um, and within that, um, we, we kind of have that. Uh, we have a three-branch system, the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. Uh, and all of that's part of that federal republic and that representative democracy. Um, and, and we have those things, generally speaking, at different levels. Federal, state, local. Uh, so we don't all use the same terminology. So at the federal level we have a president, state level we have a governor. Uh, most local levels we have mayors and village presidents and those kinds of things. Um, and so all of them collectively, all of that combined, that's our Caesar. That's our, that's our government. Our government is our modern day equivalent to their Caesar. Uh, the Roman Empire, actually the Romans, they had a, a Senate, uh, but the Senate did a lot of the bidding for, for the emperor. And the emperor didn't have the same kind of checks and balances that, that our presidents have. Um, and so when we think about it, think about Caesar equaling our government. Now, if we think that way, uh, we want to uh, 
go back to what Jesus had to say to them, I believe applies to us today. Jesus would say to us today, give back to our government what belongs to our government, and to God what is God's. Uh, and so, you know, in America we talk about taxation without representation, we're against that, and we fought for that, that we don't have that. Uh, and so none of us like paying taxes, but at the same time, we recognize that we need to pay taxes. Uh, you know, we elect people who create taxes um, because we like all of the things that taxes buy us. Um, you know, most Americans want a strong military. Most, most Americans want a, a police force. We want firefighters. Uh, we want education. Uh, you know, we, we want those things, and they've got to be paid for. And so we can bicker about how the taxes are formulated and who pays what shares and all of those things. But we all agree that, that taxing is the right system for our kind of government. That there's, there's just no other way to do it. We have to have taxes to pay for the services uh, that we want. Uh, and so it's fitting that we give to government their fair share uh, of, of what they've given us. We have that exchange. We give back to our government what our government's given to us uh, using uh, that kind of a currency. Um, the problem comes in, and it, it was a problem then, it's a problem now, is if ever Caesar wants to have God's share. Uh, Caesar deserved to get taxes. Caesar didn't deserve to be worshipped. When Caesar says... I want you to worship me, I'm divine, uh, that's when you have to say, no, wait a minute, I can give you the taxes, I can even give you honor and respect because you're the leader and we're supposed to respect our leaders, but you don't get worship. That's reserved for God. Uh, we fall short of, of, uh, of that level of, uh, of loyalty. Um, and so we want to firmly set in our minds, especially during a week when when we've been patriotic, um, that our real king is not Caesar, that is, it's not our government, but it's Jesus Christ. That's our real king. Those of you who were here last week, you may remember uh, that part of this message included me reading in Matthew 28, where Jesus is about to go back up into heaven, and he makes the statement, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That kind of makes him king, doesn't it? Uh, he has all authority in heaven and on earth. All authority. He's king. No matter how much Caesar wants to be king, no matter how much our government wants to be our leader, they don't rise to the level of Jesus. Jesus is the real king. Uh, and so while we give to our government what our government deserves, you know, we, uh, we have honor and loyalty and, and uh, a couple of our guys have, have given their time in the armed services. Uh, you know, we have all of that, but we don't worship America. Um, unfortunately, you see people that kind of do. Uh, and, and that's when things come into, come into creating problems. Um, they put government before God. Um, well, we talked about what, what does Caesar deserve, what does God deserve, what does the government deserve, but what actually belongs to God? Remember when Jesus asked, whose image is on the coin? Give it back to God. Whose image is on us? Remember the scripture reading that I read today from Genesis? Let us make mankind in our image. In the image of God created he them. You know, We humans have been implanted with God's image. We were made in his image. His image is all over us. Uh, which means if we're going to give back to God what's God's, um, we can go to Romans 12.1 where I think Paul worded it 
extremely well. Romans 12.1, Paul says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. We are supposed to give our very selves to God. Um, you know, we always hear, you know, I'm willing to die for this or that cause. Uh, are you willing to live for that cause? We are supposed to live for God. Living sacrifices, not just give yourselves. Uh, if called upon, which most of us never will be, we might need to go the way of martyrdom. We might have to actually die for Christ. But most of us, it never comes to that. But the question is, can we live for Christ? Can we give ourselves as a living sacrifice so that we're his, not ours? Uh, that's the sacrifice we're supposed to make. That's what we're supposed to give back to God. Uh, having been made in his image, we're his. And, and we just need to, to live that way. Uh, so I think for Christ the King Sunday, it's uh, very fitting that it falls at a time uh, when our minds have been uh, on, on patriotism and our country and our loyalty that it's just a reminder that while all of that's good you know while all of that's here Christ the King is up here and that's where our ultimate loyalty belongs and our ultimate sacrifices belong let's pray